Hey everybody, I have a video here for you today, and I've been going over messages and comments, questions, and this is a good video for me to make, because it relates to some of them, plus it's a good one to follow up my Egyptian pyramid series with. And I can talk about the mound builders, who they were exactly, the Mayans, and a mysterious uh, question concerning the Mayans and where they went. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say I taped a segment with Cliff Dunning on Earth's Ancients, and I think that will be broadcast this Saturday. I'm assuming, if my information is correct, but I just want to thank uh, Cliff for actually tracking me down on Facebook. Not easy to do. And we taped a segment, and it might not be the last time I am on his podcast, but I just want to thank him for the interest. But let's talk about ancient America here. And this was really the most fat one of the most <clears throat> excuse me, one of the most fascinating things I researched, and this was a couple years ago. I did a series on a whole bunch of pre-Columbus sites in ancient America, and this is really lost history. This is history that your government really never wanted brought up, because according to the people who uh, founded the country, this country was really unclaimed. There was no great civilizations living in the Americas back then, but there was and I'm just going to show you one proof of that. Now, the mound builders, there is a whole set of mounds all over the mid and eastern and upper United States. Who are these mound builders? That is a name attached to them. Well, I think that's a lame name to call a great civilization. The mound builders, really? Aren't you going to identify these people? Well, to me, it's clear who they were. The Mayans disappeared around uh, maybe 900 AD, 1080, somewhere in there, I think closer to 900 AD. Ancient alien theorists will tell you they maybe beamed up to the skies. But let's take a look at this with a more realistic approach. The temperature of the Earth heated up greatly about a thousand years ago, a little over a thousand years ago. Where would your culture have gone if things really heated up? Would you have gone south? No, you would have gone north to a more suitable climate. The mound builders really have never been identified, and it's clear to me through the artifacts, the symbolism, the text, everything we have left, the direct connection to Orion and the turtle and that kind of symbolism. The mound builders were the Mayans, or at least the Mayans greatly affected people in this region, but the Mayans came north, it's clear. This is the Great Pyramid of the ancient United States. This is Cahokia, and this really... The measurements compare to the Great Pyramid as far as how big it is. Well, let's just go down and take a peek at Earth view. And some people don't even know there's a huge pyramid. And this is no different than the pyramids in Egypt or uh, Mexico or Mesoamerica or Peru. As far as what they symbolized, they used the earth material in the area. Some people built with limestone. Some people built with other stone material. What was available up here? earth basically this is the great plains or the southern great plains but this is a massive pyramid step pyramid this represented a turtle to me and i think that's clear from the turtle symbolism from the artifacts a lot of turtle shells many turtle shells thousands of them found in and around cahokia because that was the center of creation and these mayan pyramids all the way from teotihuacan I think to the Great Pyramid, represented creation and new creation. I'm just going to read really quickly here. It says, and this talks about the three hearthstones on the back of the cosmic turtle. And I'll be reading more about this. It says, the Maya saw this hearth as a triangle of stars below Orion's belt with the Orion Nebula as the fire today we call these stars. Alnitak, Safe, and Rigel, the gods set up this hearth. And then it gives a date here, which comes out to be August 13th, 3114 B.C. Now, why did that start at the same time as the first dynasty of Egypt? Well, I'll be reading more about an exact connection or a direct connection between the Mayans and the Egyptians and their great gods and Orion. But this is lost history here. The Mayans affected the people in this area. They built a great city. 
They used the Mississippi as their highway. The Mississippi was no different than the Nile. This, the Mississippi was their celestial Nile and their symbolism. And it was about the paddler gods going on to the afterlife. And that is the same as the solar boat in Egypt. It's the exact same thing. This is lost history at its best when it comes from the United States, which people in the United States don't even know this lost great history, pyramid cities. And I'm going to finish this up at the end with a clip from In Search Of. And I went over the Archaeoastronomy of Cahokia, the importance of the spring equinox. And there is a wood henge right here that is like kind of like Stonehenge. And I showed on a Cahokia video, and I'm going to leave a bunch of links below, how the rising sun comes up right over the big pyramid. If you are standing at the center of this wood henge, which is right in this area, the spring sunrise on March 21st, the day that signifies the equal point of light and darkness, that sun comes right up over this pyramid. And here's a video I did on Cahokia a few years ago. And this is the Woodhenge, the lost Woodhenge. But you can see here they have put in posts where they have found ancient holes. And if you line yourself up, I did this video exactly on March 21st, but here, you are right above the center post of that Woodhenge at Cahokia. And here you can see how the sun pops up right over that Great Pyramid of Cahokia on March 21st. Symbolism, really, on March 21st, the spring equinox that is shown throughout the world. Giza, Angkor Wat, Angkor Wat, Bora Brodeur, other sites. That day is very important and it is cross-culture. It's a direct alignment. It's the same symbolism, the same day as in ancient Egypt. And I'm going to be going over a few more connections. But if these people saw the sun coming out or rising up from their pyramid of the new creation, that was serious symbolism right there. And it's right next, the pathway of the Mississippi has changed greatly, but you can tell it went right next to this place in ancient times. But I'm going to read from my videos from about two years ago when I did a whole series. Check out the playlist also because I've done many, many videos on Mayan pyramid sites, probably over three dozen. So check out the links. Now let's read a little bit here from uh, some videos I did two years ago. And really I have gone over how the pyramid of Teotihuacan the Pyramids of Giza, there seems to be a central story of creation. Now the Mayans, I have done countless videos on Mayan pyramid sites, and I have gone over the Turtle of Creation, but in just in review, they s signified the three stars at the top, the top uh, level of the turtle's back, and these are uh, representative of the three belt stars of Orion. Now the three hearthstones of creation, they are these three stars in the constellation of Orion. And the smoky place of creation is at the very center of that triangle, and that's the Orion Nebula. So Orion, the three hearthstones, this pyramid here, that is where the eye and the pyramid symbolism originated from. But it all has to do with Orion and creation. It says, when the maze gods arrived at the place of the new creation, they sprang up from a crack in the back of a cosmic turtle. The Maya saw this turtle as the three stars that we call Orion's belt, and they also saw the crack in the turtle's back as the ball court. And I will leave links below. And that is direct connection to uh, really what we see in Egypt and other sites when they are talking about creation and it says the new creation these according to the Mayans the world was destroyed four times the new creation well let's go on and read a little more and this comes from a video I did on the Mayan creation myth Orion and a St. Paul mound way up in Minnesota why did I do this video well because when they were excavating these mounds and this is a St. Paul neighborhood today. And this is the way it looked. 
well over 100 years ago, before the city of St. Paul decided to remove these mounds to give the rich people on Summit Avenue a better view of the river. This is the way it looked. I think there was a heavy mine influence all the way up into Minnesota. What did they find when they excavated this mound, or th these mounds in this area? A huge triangular hearthstone pit with fire in the middle, representing exactly what the turtle of creation, the three hearthstones, and the belt stars of Orion symbolizes. In the creation myth, this was found all the way up in St. Paul. And in this video, what did they find when they excavated inside of the, one of these big mounds? What are these? What did they find? These are chambers, burial chambers. These were pretty uh, well-made structures with different material. This is the way it looked a long time ago. But what was found in here also? Good archaeological research was done, but a very important ruler. What did he have over his face? He had a Mayan death mask on. He had exactly what the Mayans put over the faces of their dead to preserve the life of the face, really, is kind of how what it symbolized. But in a comment here, I just put a little further in the report, these Mayan death masks were found all over the upper Midwest, into Wisconsin, and other mound cities. Once again, I'll leave the links for this below, but the Mayans had a clear influence. And you're going to see in that video, the In Search of video, just how influential that was. And it's kind of clear and obvious. But a few other things here. Is there a connection to these original stories and what we see in Egypt? Let me just read. The Egyptian grain god Osiris was called Sahu, and I've gone over that from the earliest texts coming from the earliest Egyptians and how that signified the soul of the dead king Osiris, which really symbolized the embodiment of everyday man, his soul. But when it, when it went to live in the afterlife in the constellation of Orion, it was called Sahu. And it says, the Egyptian green god Osiris was called Sahu when associated with Orion. He is not only in his boat, but the three stars of Orion appear over his head. And that's what this symbolism here, afterlife, boat, celestial Nile, the Milky Way. And this is Orion, this is not Cygnus. But it says, going back to the Americas, the star Kachina, of the Hopi is called Sohu or Suhu. Again, the Egyptian god Osiris is called Sahu in his celestial sky form. There are three stars on this Kachina, Sohu's headdress, which bring to mind the most important con constellation in Hopi cosmology, Orion. And Orion has three stars at its center called the Belt of Orion. Archaeologists know the Hopi had contact with Mesoamerica. The Hopi even had parrot clan, and there are no parrots of the Macau variety native to the desert. Macaws could only survive in the wild of the Maya humid lands of Mesoamerica. It says, according to National Geographic, the Orion Nebula is where stars are born, perhaps the creation of planetary systems like ours. Due to a cloudy-like smoky haze appearance to the naked eye within this triangle of three stars in Orion, Mesoamericans mirrored this imagery with the three hearthstones for their fires. In the very opening scene of that clip of In Search Of, get a note of the shape of that fire pit. I just wanted to mention that, but that seems to bring up a great question here. Is there a common source for all this spiritual symbolism and imagery in ancient texts that we have? Is there a common source? Well, this really ties the Mayans and the Egyptians together. The similarity of the name of Osiris and the Hopi Kachina god. It's almost identical. It's the same story on different sides of the earth. I just find that fascinating. And it seems the turtle and the Mayans and Orion were linked in some of their temples. And here I did a video on Copan. And in their uh, carvings, they tracked the Orion Nebula in 652 AD. And it says, 
In the center of a cosmology significant Mayan constellation known as the Three Hearthstones, the Orion Nebula is described by contemporary Maya as the smoke from a fire that was lit in this hearth. The Copan baseline, along with other classic Maya texts, suggests that this hearth was the birth, birthplace of the sun. I'm going over to uh, a video here, if I can find it. It says, when the gods arrived at the place of the new creation, they sprang up from a crack in the back of the cosmic turtle. And let's go over to Google Earth real quick. And here is that giant pyramid at Cahokia. And where did the gods and the rulers live? They lived right on the top here. And if the gods sprang from the crack in the turtle's back at the new creation, everything fits. Symbolism, text, a connection with the ancient Egyptians. But the Mayans, they came northward. The climate in Mexico and Mesoamerica was not suitable for them. The only logical place was to come north. They uh, came up had some great influence on the natives in the area, probably brought wealth and trade up north. They used the Mississippi as the Great Highway. This is the Great Pyramid City of Cahokia, clearly a Mayan site, all the Mayan sites from Mesoamerica and Mexico. If you really look at the symbolism, the archaeoastronomy, and then you look at the mound builders and what they had to say, they came up north. The mound builders were the Mayans. They mixed with the natives and they made some great pyramid cities. Hope you thought that was interesting. Now here is a clip from In Search Of, which I thought really was so well done. I needed to share it. Hope you thought this was cool and you all have a very nice day. Long ago on the Midwestern Plain, men and women gathered to watch the skies. In a sacred ritual led by a priest of the sun, these people made the ultimate sacrifice. All that is left of these earthen mounds, they may conceal the secret of a Mayan legacy. Long before the first explorers came to America, an extraordinary civilization arose in southern Illinois. The people had no metal tools, no written language. But their lives were ordered by a profound understanding of nature and the universe. On these mounds once stood the temples of a great metropolis, home to 40,000 men and women. The Indians flourished for 500 years, then they disappeared. Beneath the mounds, scientists uncovered a fascinating clue to the origins of the lost city of Cahokia. In 1961, Dr. Warren Whitry of the University of Illinois began an excavation on the outskirts of the mounds. In a series of deep pits, he found remnants of wooden posts. At first, he thought they were part of a giant stockade surrounding the city. As more poles were unearthed, Whitry became convinced that a grand design lay behind their arrangement. He began to reconstruct the ancient site, sinking new posts in the original holes. What anthropologists knew about the Indians of Cahokia did not prepare him for what would be revealed. The post seemed to form a giant circle, like a circle of stone erected 3,000 years before at Stonehenge. We believe that the American Woodhenge functioned in 
somewhat the same way as the famous site in England known as Stonehenge. These sites were used by ancient people to observe sunrise at various times of the year, and the observation of sunrise served as a kind of calendar. Woodhenge was built with a precision that is astonishing even today. It was analyzed on the same computer used for Stonehenge, and the circle at Cahokia proved more accurately aligned to the sun. From Whitfrey's discovery, anthropologists were able to reconstruct the pattern of Cahokian life. They found that here was a culture different from other tribes of North America. Their society revolved around a calendar that linked men on Earth with the gods who ruled the skies. Before beginning any new enterprise, the people sought the guidance of the sun. Each morning, a priest of the sun went out to greet the dawn. Like the chiefs of other tribes, his power was absolute, for only a priest could communicate with the gods. Inside the mounds was evidence that the sun priest was even more powerful than other chiefs. His death carried great import for the whole of Cahokian society. Were the Cahokians inspired by ideas from another place and time? Deep in the Mexican jungle at Teotihuacan, a remarkable culture whose religion required such sacrifices was flourishing by 500 AD. They were the Mayans. Their society was the most advanced on the entire continent. Their cities reveal a surprising knowledge of architecture and engineering. Their tower observatories mapped the skies as accurately as the telescopes of today. The Mayans developed the earliest written language and a system of mathematics and geometry that had no equal. While it is difficult to imagine a relationship between their culture and the early Indians of America, thousands of miles to the north, beneath the mounds there may lie the connection between Cahokia and the ancient cities of Mexico. Dr. Wittry explains we have identified a tentative Cahokia yard, a unit of measurement that was used over and over again in even multiples. The Cahokia yard is nearly identical to the standard measurement used by the Mayans throughout their empire. An intriguing correspondence in time may connect their societies. The turning point in Cahokia's development came around the year 900, precisely as the Mayan civilization was drawing to an end in Mexico. The Mayans have vanished. No one knows where they fled when their cities began to die. Do the similarities in religion and astronomy tell us the Mayans went far to the north? Could they have traveled 5,000 miles to the Indians of Cahokia with their ideas and culture intact? It's incredible to imagine that the ideas of one culture could be transferred across an entire continent in a single century. How can we account for the mysterious parallels that seem to exist? Was there a bridge between the jungle strongholds of the Mayans and the mounds in Illinois? We may find an answer in the southwestern desert that lies between them. A thousand years ago, a desert tribe called Anasazi erected a city of stone towers unlike anything else seen in this country. The secret of these strange towers in Utah has eluded scientists for many centuries. If they were storehouses, why do they have windows? If they were watchtowers, why are the windows so small? Recently, an astronomer from the Smithsonian Institution has advanced a new theory. Dr. Ray Williamson thinks they were built to observe the heavens. What's particularly exciting about this room 
is that there are three sun alignments in it. Now, we consider this combination of three alignments to be an excellent uh, calendar room. It's an excellent place, even today, where we could, uh, if we stayed here long enough throughout the year, actually put marks on the walls to tell us what day it is and to be to very accurately determine the summer solstice the winter solstice and the equinox several of the towers have strategic windows that line up with the rising moon it would have taken many generations of careful study to make them so accurate Dr. Williamson believes the alignments would provide the basis for predicting eclipses, a complex procedure understood by only a few cultures. We have indications here that they were going in the direction of developing a calendar as complicated as a Mayan calendar. That's a guess, that's a hypothesis. It's one that we're working on right now. These towers have been mysteries for years. Some people have suggested that these towers are reminiscent of the Mayan towers. I'm not sure. Mayan observatories took a circular form, an expression in stone of the wind and the cosmos. Did they inspire the tower observatories of the Southwest? found recently some small evidence of Mexican influence up in this area. And perhaps that's associated with the towers that are here, I don't know. I think they're still mysteries. Three hundred miles from the Anasazi, another ancient people erected a temple to the skies. They too have disappeared, but they left behind an important clue. The observatory at Casa Grande, Arizona, remains as evidence that these Indians sought to understand the universe. Of an entire Pueblo, only a few walls have survived the centuries. Despite the protection of its sheltering roof, the observatory may not last for another 50 years. The, uh, Ho -Ho Indians. Robert Hicks of the University of Arizona has been investigating Casa Grande. Uh, this, the alignments are very similar to Mayan astronomical alignments at the Caracol Observatory in Mexico. We find the same alignments here as we do in the Caracol, and we feel that there was an influence from Central America. We feel that a representative of the Mayan elite, somebody with a specialized knowledge about astronomy and also site planning, may have come up to direct the construction of this building. Most anthropologists do not accept this theory. But recently, scientists have uncovered new evidence that may redefine the extent of the Mayan legacy. In the deserts of the Southwest, this country's prehistoric astronomy reached its greatest heights. If there was a link between the ancient Mayans and the Indians of Cahokia, a continent away, perhaps we will find it here. A Pueblo in New Mexico may well be the crossroads in that ancient connection. It is Chaco Canyon, built out of stone and brick by the Anasazi, architects of the mysterious towers in Utah. In a massive ceremonial structure called the Great Kiva, astronomers found evidence of a scientific knowledge that rivals anything we know today. At the summer solstice, Dr. Williamson has come to observe the dawn. Every year on the 21st of June, the sun repeats a timeless pattern. All right. Now that will just about get the sun coming over. There it comes. We're here in Chaco Canyon in a great kiva, Kasserin Kanata, to determine the astronomical alignments of this building that we're in. We're here on the solstice because 
on the solstice, the sun comes through this port that you see uh, and falls on that low niche over there. The solstice was a special time for the Indians who constructed this building. They needed to know when the solstice occurred to set their calendar. At the winter solstice, a ritual of fire ushered in the new year. In December, the sun seemed to stop in its winter house. The Indians mounted an elaborate display of fire and light to prompt their god, the sun, and set the year in motion. The ceremony of fire can be traced to the ancient cities of Mexico. How did it come to the Anasazi? A thousand years ago, the dwellings at Chaco were dug into the ground. Then, quite suddenly, an extraordinary change swept the canyon. The Anasazi began to build a city of towering pueblos. Almost overnight, Chaco became an active center of agriculture and trade. Its wealth based on the rich deposits of turquoise that lay nearby. The population grew to 25,000 men and women as the Indians learned to mine the stone. The turquoise attracted merchants from far away. Some believe that Mexican traders came north seeking the sacred stone for the worship of their god, Quetzalcoatl. Turquoise is the god stone for Quetzalcoatl. It was also important to some of the other Mexican... Dr. Uh, Jonathan uh, Raymond of Illinois State again, University. If Quetzalcoatl is going to be properly served, he's got to have the turquoise that he demands. Mexico had turquoise, but not enough. The Southwest had abundant turquoise, and so the merchants of Quetzalcoatl and the other deity cults came out of North Mexico into the Southwest looking for turquoise. The merchants were men of high status called Pochteca, employed by the courts of Mexico to supply their temples with turquoise. To Chaco, they brought new crops, more productive corn. Was it simple trade or something more? For here were the peoples of two distant cultures speaking different languages. Did they achieve a deeper communication that reached beyond trade? Was information part of the exchange? At the head of the canyon, the Indians constructed an elaborate road system stretching for 300 miles. Was it built to welcome travelers from the south? Did the merchants also receive more than the sacred stone itself? Raymond believes the Anasazi not only supplied the raw turquoise, but actually worked it into finished products. The beads and ritual mosaics used by the Mexican culture thousands of miles away. And in time, Chaco and the other areas around it came under the heavy influence of Mexican exploitation, economic exploitation, for the betterment of these religious cults of North Mexico. In an excavation for the National Science Foundation, Raymond unearthed dramatic evidence to support his claim. He discovered two tombs that were like no others seen in this country. Two skeletons were found, laid out on thousands of turquoise beads. Twelve men had been beheaded to accompany them in death. To Raymond, the implications were clear. These were the graves of important visitors from another land. 